God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. How are you doing? So good to have you with us today. We're going to be digging into the word, and I believe God has something really juicy for us. And um, uh, you, I don't want you to miss it. And so uh, I believe you will really get a kick out of it. It's going to bless you. I mean, it really is. It's going to bless you. So how's your week been? I pray it's been well. Uh, talking to various people and a lot of people have lost loved ones. We're not going to have a moment of silence. We're going to have a moment of prayer. And let's pray for the people who have lost loved ones. Father, we pray for those families that we know whom our lives are connected to. We pray, Father, that your peace that passes all understanding would be upon them, Lord, that you would help them through this time of grieving, that you would minister to them, that you would comfort them, that you would reveal your love to them, and that your peace that passes all understanding would be upon them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Listen, um, this is a very interesting season that we're in. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Very interesting season and the world, right? We just had uh, a comet and a eclipse. And it was very, I, I was watching the eclipse and the comet on someone's computer and uh, it was interesting, you know, it was interesting. Usually, well, last time I saw an eclipse, it was just the moon blocking the sun. But this time, it was not only the moon blocking the sun, but there was a comet going by at the same time. And so I don't know if that normally happens with, um, with the eclipse, but it happened this time. So it was very interesting, and I, I hope you guys had a chance to, to see that. If not, you know what? Google it. <laughs> it's on Google, man. What don't they put on Google, right? What don't they put on Google? So there's a lot of stuff on there. Let's get into our topic today. We're going to be talking, um, picking up where we left off. We're going to be talking about entering his rest, and we're going to be talking uh, from the standpoint of of Pentecost, and I want to give you some scriptures. You know, we we didn't and jump into it that much uh, last time, and uh, and so I, I want you to really look at this because this is going to be very very interesting, and I believe it will, I believe it will bless you a lot, you know, and so um. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. As I was studying it, it there was just a lot of, of revelation and information that started coming into, into my heart. And so without any further ado, let me go ahead and give me one moment. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, well, welcome to Jesus Christ Ministries International. All right, this is our roundtable Bible discussion. I believe, um, I believe God has something special for us, all right? So let me set this up. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let me, uh, let's get into this. Any From anywhere around the world, people could get on this, on this podcast. So I want to encourage you to do something. Invite anybody and everybody you can think of. Just invite them, right? Really do that. Invite them. 
Okay, so it doesn't matter where they are, the park, at home, or anywhere else, all right? We're in a series called Enter His Rest. I'm your host, Pastor and Evangelist Anthony L. Murray Sr. And that this ought to be good for you. This really ought to be good for you. God's Sabbath rest. All right, so we're going to recap, then we're going to go into the message. Why do we recap? Because I don't know who's watching. Could be somebody new that don't know what in the world we're talking about. So these are some key points that would be really good for you to understand. God's Sabbath rest. And, and during this roundtable Bible discussion, you are free to uh, type in, do not open the mic, to type in comments and questions, and, and then we go from there, okay? So key points about the Sabbath is you must enter. You must enter. Now, the Sabbath means rest. It means rest in God. It doesn't mean go to sleep, go to bed, even though that's inclusive in it, but it doesn't mean that. It means to rest in God. All right, you have to enter it. The Sabbath has already been provided for us. Now we have to enter. Um, when someone enters into the Sabbath, they have accepted Christ as their Savior or as their Passover lamb. Another good point we want to bring out is God's Sabbath deals with, but is not limited to, these following areas salvation. All right, faith, peace, healing, physical sleep, godly relations. You have to exercise your faith. You know, I've met a lot of Christians, and I meet Christians all the time, that don't know God. They're Christians now, but they don't know God. What, what does that mean? What do I mean by that? And they don't fellowship with God. They fellowship with the world. They, they fellowship with their problems. They fellowship with their frustrations. They fellowship with their anguish. They fellowship, all right, you know, with everything outside of their relationship with God. Well, what we have to learn how to do to experience God's rest is to fellowship with God, not just attend church, fellowship with God. And and uh, take him at his word, practice his word. And a lot of people don't do that. So what else about, about the Sabbath that's very important? It starts with relationship, not church. Excuse me. It starts with relationship. It starts with trusting God, walking and living by faith and in faith with and for God. Jesus gave the invitation to every human being, where every human being accept what he's done and what he's doing? No. All right? Sabbath is eternal. Rest in God is eternal. It is not a religion. All right? We enter, when we enter, miracles happen. And they start with us. The first miracle, when you give your life to Christ, that's a miracle. You accept Christ as your Savior, that's a miracle. Okay? Very important. All right. Moving right along, because we don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on the review, right? We just want to cover, cover just a little bit. Jesus was crucified on Passover now. The Passover that Christians celebrate, that date is different than the Passover that uh, on the Jewish calendar. They're, they're, they're uh, in the same month, but different dates. So during Jesus was buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that was immediately. Why? The Passover... Another word for it is the Feast of Salvation. 
Why was Jerry, uh, Jesus buried immediately? And why is it the unleavened bread? Because before uh, we accepted Christ, we were, we were filled with sin. After we accepted Christ, immediately, God does not see us as sinners or see our sins. He sees us through Jesus. Unleavened bread refers to sinless. He sees us through Jesus, right? So he doesn't see our sin. He sees Jesus' righteousness in our lives. All right. It resurrected on first fruit. So Jesus was crucified on Passover. Then immediately after Passover, we enter into unleavened bread and immediately uh, um, a few days after that starts what? The first fruits, right? Jesus, Jesus was resurrected on first fruits. Okay. So let's look at who Jesus is. Jesus is the lamb of God. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of heaven. Jesus is the unleavened bread. And then I gave some scriptures. Now, we're not going to read these scriptures. Why? This is just a review. And I want you guys to do your own reading. Do your own reading. Okay? You've got to do your own reading. All right. All right. Some say, hey, look, I have problems with my eyes. I understand that. Do your own reading. Get yourself a magnifying glass or put it on television and, uh, and attach your, your computer to the television and you could pull it up and I'll tell you what, there'll be some large letters up there. Okay. Key points about first fruits. There's some scriptures there. I'm not going to read them all. First harvest, the first harvest required by God to give the best of the first, all right? What did they give? Animals, grain, fruit, olive oil, new wine, and their hearts. So when we give to God our first, our best, our best should be our hearts. Really, you give your heart. That's the best you could give God. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't, look, all that is symbolic, right? That is symbolic of our love for God, our appreciation for what he's done and to further the gospel. But he needs our hearts. So we give our hearts, right? Given the best of our first, we acknowledge that everything we have belongs to God and came from God. So when they gave the grain, the olive oil, the wine, uh, the lamb or whatever, is because they recognized that everything they have is because of God. So when we give a tithe and offering to the Lord, we're recognizing that everything we have belongs to him and we have what we have because of him, okay? All right, Israel is recognized as God's first fruit. Where is it? No, no, we're, we're, we're talking about keys, key points of first fruit. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It has everything to do with Jesus being the first fruits because we're talking about first fruits. First fruits. So when they gave their first in the beginning of that season, it was a acknowledgement to God in the beginning of the harvest season that what they have can come from God. And now it's an honoring, it's an honoring uh action. So they honored God with their first. Now, it could be grain, it could be olive oil, could be an animal, it could be everything. But the most important thing that they gave and that we give is our heart. All right. And so 
we look at that, you could go to Exodus 23, 16, Exodus 34, 22, Numbers 28, 26, Leviticus 23, verse 15 and 16, Matthew chapter 27, verse 52 and 53, okay? So those scriptures will confirm. And if you go to St. John chapter 20, uh, verse 3 through 9, or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 28, all right? We're talking about... All right, all right. We're, we're... Mm -hmm. All right, so the Festival of First Fruits acknowledged there's a combination of two things. It acknowledged that everything that they have was given to them by God. And so they present to God their best, the first fruits. Yes, study it. You study it. All right. Now, we're not we're not looking at just uh, the Lord as the first fruits, which He is the first fruits. But we look at all. We look at the totality of the picture of first fruits. Not just our Lord Jesus. He is the first fruits of those risen from the dead. He is the first fruit of our of uh, the presentation to God the Father uh, after the resurrection. Yes, that is absolutely correct. But we're looking. That again. All right. So. In the heart, in the mind of the Jewish culture, the feast is, and you have to understand that the Jewish community has not yet accepted the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. So in their hearts, they're still presenting first things the first fruits of things, the first fruits of, of what means something dear to them, they're presenting it to God. So that's part of their festival. Now, when we look at the spiritual part of the festival, we see the first fruits being Jesus as resurrected from the dead. All right. So you have the natural side and you have the spiritual side. When you look at the totality of first fruits, it combines the natural and the spiritual. You're not going to have one without the other. Then we have the Feast of Weeks, extended seven weeks after Passover. Okay? Um, it's, it's accumulated on the 50th day. So you have, you have Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, then immediately the, the uh, feast of of uh, weeks that lasts for seven weeks, the accumulation being on the fiftieth day, seven weeks, seven days, seven times seven is forty nine. The fiftieth day is known as Pentecost. First fruits were presented at the feast of harvest. Now, what's really important about this? is this the harvest and why we why did we bring up the natural side of first fruits this is why because in the jewish calendar the first fruits is uh, symbolizes harvest a harvest of first fruits and then in the middle of that uh, between the first fruits and and the Pentecost is another harvest, all right, and that is called unleavened bread, which moves into uh, uh, 
the feast of weeks or the feast of 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 uh of first fruits and that carries on okay seven more weeks all that is harvest it accumulates with a massive harvest on the day of pentecost all that is symbolic and god used the natural to explain the spiritual why did he why does he do that because most people don't understand the spiritual. Most people are too carnal. Jesus said to, to one of the Jewish leaders, he said, wait a minute. Yes, you're a Jewish leader, and yet you don't understand spiritual things. I mean, he was talking to him about being born again, all right, in the book of St. John. So most people don't understand that. So it's very important to explain the spiritual, and it happens. You can explain it with the natural. You start to walk in the revelation if you open your heart, open your mind. You start walking in the revelation of what's happening in the spiritual if you allow God, allow God to show you why he set things up like he did in the natural. So they brought baskets. Now, during that harvest season, as the fruit is growing, man, they reap massive amounts of, of fruit, vegetables, wheat, um, uh, wine, grapes, olive oil, olives, are massive amounts during that seven-week period, all right? It's symbolized harvest, harvest. Now, we look at, we look at this, and, and, um, Okay, Holy Spirit. Remember when when uh, uh, Jesus spoke with Peter one day, and he saw Peter. Peter was fishing, and and uh, they several things happened. Several things happened. Right. First, he promised Peter that he would make him a fisher of who. Men, all right? We're going to see that in a minute because that happened, all right? Now, he gave him a natural illustration, though. And how did he give him that natural illustration? Well, he did it like this on two different occasions. They were fishing, and as they were fishing, their net began to break through, um, but how did that happen? Through them obeying his word when he told them what to do. They obeyed. They said, all right, nevertheless, that's your word. We're going to do. Well, remember, he saw them, right? Remember, he saw them. He saw them fishing. And uh, and and they he, he said to them, hey, you guys catch anything? No, that was the second time. The first time. The first time um, when they were fishing and they could not, they didn't catch anything and and he told them what to do. Well, throw your net on the right side of the boat, right? And um, uh, they threw the net. They had to get other boats. Uh, look it up, look it up, look it up. I, I don't remember if he said net or net, but what, what happened? The net, or nets begin to break. All right, they had to get boats, they had more than one boat to bring in, and they had all different size fish. All right, now that was very interesting, right? It was a natural example to explain a prophetic truth, something that was going to happen in his life. A second time, Jesus, uh, they. This is after the resurrection. Jesus talking to them, and uh, they're they're fishing, and they were fishing all night. He said, "Hey, y'all catch anything?" He said, "No." Then he said, "Well, well, do this," and they did what he said. I believe that was the second time when he told them to throw the the net on the right side. Yeah. Excuse me, and they had a harvest of fish, and and. Uh, what happened? 
the net or nets did not break that second time. They caught a harvest of a big, so those were symbolic. Those were symbolisms of what happens as people obey the word of God. All right, what are you reading? Oh, well, where, where are you looking? I don't have my. All right, so when we look at this, we see that Jesus was setting the stage, was setting the stage for harvest, preparing their hearts to catch men. Now, although he was talking to Peter, he was also talking to all of them that was there. He wasn't just Oh, yeah, I, I, I need that. I need that. I'm glad that it's over there. Bring it. I'm not going to answer, but just, just, yeah. yeah. So um, when we look at this, and, and now here's Peter, right? Who's Peter? Peter's a spoke person, right? He's, he's, he's um, outspoken. He's outspoken, right? Right? Peter's outspoken, you know. Hey, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come on the water with you, to walk on the water with you, if that's really you. You know, that's that was his attitude, right? Jesus said one word, come. What did Jesus do? And what did Peter do? He walked on the water, okay? He he, he walked on the water. So, so when we look at this, God's looking for us to do what? Obey his word. All right, now let's get into this with the fruit of Pentecost, because Pentecost is more than a celebration, is more than just speaking in tongues. It's more, it's more, so much more than that. All right, Pentecost deals with harvest. It deals with harvest. We saw the fruit or part of the fruit. Yeah, part of the fruit of Pentecost with the 120 in the upper room. The scripture where Peter was told to cast a net. All right, so we're going to look at Luke, and I, I want you to see this, Luke chapter 5. And we're going to get into this a little bit because I want you to see, I want you to see this, Luke chapter 5, verse 4 through 11. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. So he did say nets, right? All right. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and called nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, God wants us to obey his word. Uh, I will let down the net. And when he had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So there it says net was breaking singular so the net that peter was using was breaking but it doesn't talk about the other boats because keep in mind these guys they didn't fish by themselves that there was always they had a fishing company so there was always more than one boat there are fishing boats out there okay all right now so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them and and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. All right, what was that? It's a prophetic. That is prophetic, people. All right, because Jesus was going to teach this man how to be a fisher of men. 
not not just um uh a fisher of fish but a fisher find a scripture where jesus told peter that he'll be a fisher of men okay this is extremely extremely important go to matthew chapter 4 verse verse 19 yeah chapter 4 verse 19 we're going to start at verse 18 and jesus walking by the sea of galilee saw two brothers simon called peter and andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen then he said to them follow me and i will make you fishers of men they immediately left their nets and followed him. Why? Why did they leave the Bible say nets? Well, when you when you study the history of their fishing and their customs and the manner, mannerism of that, they use several no nets. All right. And they be several of them on a boat. And the boats weren't very big, but there'd be several nets. And the, the way they used to do it, they used to throw the nets in the water and then kind of drag the nets to catch, okay? Or scoop them up and and um, catch fish. So he prophesied, hey, I'm gonna make you fisher of men. Now, let's look into this because Pentecost, your Pentecost practices or customs dealt with in the natural grain, fruit, um, with natural things, all right, and they present they presented up the first fruits to the Lord, and they reap the harvest during the rest of the season. You see that they reap the harvest during the rest of the season. The first fruits was always presented to God. Now. Pentecost was another season of harvest. We see this in the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 40 and 41. And it says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Fishers of men. All right, 3,000 people. Ooh, that's a lot of souls coming to the Lord. Now, it's important to understand that these folks were the same people that were responsible for crucifying the Lord Jesus. Now, their hearts were open. But you look at Peter, the same guy who denied he even knew Jesus. Jesus prophesied and said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now, Peter is mentioned here, all right? But he's not by, he's not by himself. All right, it says, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, be safe. So you go back and you see who was with Peter. But you see, Peter is the spokesperson. He's always outspoken. Now, filled with the Holy Spirit, after his experience in the upper room, now he's the lead spokesperson, right? He's speaking. Let, let's look at some more believers that, that gave their lives to Christ and what happened. Go to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. You see, uh, Pentecost is a time of reaping. Or it's the longest season. It's a long season. All right. Now you have before that the the uh, feast of weeks, seven weeks, and then the culmination of that on the fiftieth day 
is Pentecost. During that period of time, there's a whole bunch of reaping in, right? Whole bunch of reaping. But Pentecost is the is the like, you know, like when you go um watch fireworks. I love fireworks. I, I really do. Until you get to the grand finale, the fireworks are just pretty. They're cute. You know, they do little firework, a little firework there. And then as they get closer to the grand finale, they do bigger ones. And then when they do the grand finale, and that's what Pentecost is, it's the grand finale of harvest. Boom, all the all, all the balance of fireworks and a whole bunch of fireworks. Yes. All right, so it's not all of it, because for 40 days of that seven-week period, Jesus was with, was with them. All right, for 40 days of that seven-week period. All right, so now after he told them uh, to go wait, they went, they waited in that upper room, and on that day of Pentecost, whew, the grand finale of the fireworks. Let's go to first. Corinthians. Oh, wait a minute. Did we read? Read. Let, well, let, let's read. Let, let, let's read it. Let's read it. Let's read it. Go into the book of Acts. Chapter 1. Mm -hmm. We're going to start um, We're going to start at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bar uh, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus and with his and with his brothers. Now, what's really interesting, see, his brothers were not, they had not opened their hearts to receive what he was saying. But after he was resurrected, man, all that changed. All that changed. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and this is when they uh 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 when he stood up, we're gonna bypass some of this. They begin to say, hey, look, we need to replace Judas. All right. And they replaced Judas. And you see that down in verse 26. Uh, they replaced Judas with uh, Matthias. All right. So now we go to, to um, verse ch ch chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come. So, yes, it was just one week. Seven, 40 days. No, 10 days, excuse me total 10 days all right now it doesn't tell us the amount of days we do know that we know that because of and we know it was 120 because it tells us in verse 15 all together the number of names was about 120 and said men and brethren all right so we know that now how do we know how many days you just have to do the math in your head Pentecost is on, on the 50th day. Jesus rose from the dead, was resurrected, and spent 40 days with them. Then told them to, to go to the upper room and pray. How do we know it was only 10 days? Because the feast 
uh, of weeks is only seven weeks, seven weeks. Jesus spent part of that time with them. Then we go into, then we go into the time when he told them to go pray and they did just what he said. All right, they didn't disobey. I mean, who's going to disobey Jesus after they've seen him brutally murdered on a cross, saw him die, saw him buried, went to the grave, saw he was not there, and then see him walk through a wall? Who's going to disobey? Nobody. All right? They did just what he said, and they went and they stayed in that upper room. And on the 50th day, after the Feast of Weeks, on the 50th day, the end of that feast, the, the, the confirmation of what Jesus said, sending back the, the, the sending the Holy Spirit, they could not deny. He, he, huh? Not many days from now. All right. And so it wasn't many days. They didn't have to wait. 10 days is a long time. I'll be honest with you. All right. 10 days is a long time. I don't know if you ever been. I've been in all night prayers and the longest We've had an all-night prayer with, with, uh, with fasting has been uh, maybe three days, maybe three days, not not ten. And I've been on thirty-day fast, but that was always with water. And I had been on thirty-day fast where we ate one meal and drank water, but we always had prayer for at least an hour, a couple of hours each and every day. But I want you to see this because the Pentecost experience was the culminate com, com, common uh, accumulation was was the combination or you, you know what I'm saying that that final um, uh, um, experience of the fireworks. I mean, it was spectacular. Here you have all these people during. You're, keep in mind, keep in mind, all right, the Jewish festival of Passover was going, what had already taken place, right? Unleavened bread, first, the, the, the festival of first weeks, you have all these people from different countries that are Jewish there in Jerusalem. Why? Because that's the holy city. They came from all over, and they're there. And then they had this, these, these 120 folks. Boom. Here's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost celebration. Pentecost is a specific Jewish holiday. Very, very important. All right? It's the season of harvest. You're going to say something. All right. They were coming there for, in the beginning, for Passover. For Passover. All right. And then they stayed. Because the celebration of unleavened bread is still another feast, all right. And then, and then the cele the feast of of first fruits, all right. And then after they all run together, all right. And so you have these feasts, and they're staying. These people are staying. Okay, they're staying there, and all these people heard these men and women speaking in other tongues and these tongues god could they could speak in a, a human tongue or a heavenly tongue now some folks got stuck and say the only time people speak in tongues is when they speak another earthly language 
No, no, no. Are you naive? Listen, you probably are if that's what you think, right? When, when the Apostle Paul taught about speaking in tongues, he said, though I speak in the book of Corinthians, though I speak with the tongues of men or angels, all right, or angels. That's a whole nother topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Own language. Why did that happen? Because it was a witness. It was a witness. Okay, that's why that happened. It was a witness to them of God in these unlearned men and women. Now go to the book of Acts. Again, we're gonna, I got some other scriptures for you, but we're gonna go back to Acts chapter four. Chapter four and verse four. Look at this because the power of God is upon Peter and John and these other folks. All right, we're going to start. I'm, I put verse four, but we're going to start at verse one. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. That's harvest, Acts chapter 4, verse 4. That is harvest, all right? Pentecost symbolizes harvest. So we are in the season of Pentecost, spiritually. The spiritual season of Pentecost is what we are in. The, the, the Passover has already occurred. Jesus has already been crucified and has resurrected over 2,000 years ago. The season of unleavened bread followed that immediately. Why? Because now God does not see us in our sin when we give or acknowledge Jesus as our Savior. He sees unleavened Jesus or sinless Jesus first, and he sees us through the righteousness of Jesus and his act of love for us so our sins are covered by his blood what he did immediately following that uh, we celebrate what first fruit why because it shows Jesus being the first one resurrected from the dead which is symbolic of what happens with us because of our faith in Jesus. Immediately following that, immediately following that is Pentecost. 50 days later, Pentecost. Why was Pentecost so important? Because it was the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always, even until the end. The promise of Pentecost is extremely, extremely, extremely important. So those seasons in the spirit realm has happened. We are currently in the season of Pentecost, the greatest harvest. It is a harvest season. 
that's why these 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 uh, festivals are so important because they're God's timetable of what is happening in the spirit realm and what has happened mm -hmm. and what's going to happen. So everything is being fulfilled, right? The day of Pentecost is what we're living in right now. The greatest heart, look at the, the people that God has raised up. I don't even know all their names, but I, I know the, um, uh, Billy, I think it was Billy Holiday. I forget her name. I think it was Billy. Uh, you look at Catherine Kuhlman. You look at Billy Graham. Look, look, look at, I'm uh, not Billy Holiday. No, she's a singer. Um, uh, Billy, uh, uh, Billy Graham. Yeah, Bill, Billy Graham. Yeah, Billy Graham and and uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth. Look, uh, you, you just get, you could get a book of these people who's walking and working, and you, and you, right? Walking and working, you're walking miracle and working miracles, right? You're walking miracle and you're working miracles, all right? God is working through his body today. There's miracles happening all over the place. People giving their lives to Christ. In some cases, just a few, in other cases, multitudes of people getting saved, right? Look at Joyce. People have been talking about Joyce Myers. Hey, listen, there's souls coming to the kingdom through that woman's ministry. Okay, so this is a season of harvest. All right. Now let, let me get to um first Corinthians 15 and and uh 20 verse 20. First Corinthians 15 verse 20 says, I think you asked first Corinthians 15, verse 20. And it says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. James chapter 1, verse 18. James chapter 1, verse 18. James chapter 1, verse 18. And it says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. All right? Whoa, what a powerful word for the body of Christ today. All right? What are we sharing here? Pentecost is unnatural. It is supernatural. It has nothing to do with natural. The, the festival of Pentecost that God established um, was a natural festival that spoke of the spiritual. So we look at Romans and I don't have time to read it all. It's almost time to, to quit. Romans chapter 11, verse 11 through 31. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I will read that because it's shorter. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse uh, 17 through 21, and it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is, a new, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All right, why? Because we've been engrafted. Oh, that's what Romans is about, about our being engrafted into the body. See, oh, boy. Whew. I wish I had time to go into it. I don't have time all I, I don't have all the time. I, I want you to see this. See, we are not the natural branch. We are the engrafted branch. What God did was against, so to speak, spiritual nature. 
we were engrafted. Oh, understand Pentecost. Understand, that's why God sent uh, Paul to the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas' ministry were to the Gentiles. All right, let, let me uh, complete reading this so we can conclude. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Understand, although God saved every, Jesus died for everyone. Salvation is available for every single person on earth. But not every single person is going to accept this gift of salvation. So in our reaping season, we are begging people to give their lives to Christ. We are imploring them. We are pleading with them to allow God to open their hearts. And that's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 is talking about. Let me read verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sent for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we might become. The only way we become is by accepting Jesus as the Passover lamb. Uh -huh. In the clouds, yeah. Hey, look, I, this is the season right here. Mm -hmm. Understand why the the Feast of Weeks and Pentecost, understand why that's the longest. Because God has is given a window of grace and mercy so that people will have an opportunity so that he knows how hard the hearts of people are. He know how rebellious people are, all right? And so he's given us the opportunity to ask him for forgiveness, to accept his grace, to accept his, his love, to accept Jesus and what Jesus did for us. I, I really encourage you to read Romans chapter 10, verse 11 through 31, because it talks about how we have been engrafted, engrafted. We weren't even part of the branch, part of the tree. It, because of their disobedience, the, the, the Jewish nation, because of their disobedience, their disobedience opened the door, opened the way for our obedience of faith. See, they did not walk in faith accepting what happened. But when you accept Jesus, then that means you are walking in faith. Okay. All right. Well, praise the Lord. The fruit of Pentecost, very powerful. We may have to talk about that one again. Listen, if you've not accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, now is the time. Why wait? Why put it off? You cannot receive Jesus after you're dead. No one's going to pray you out of hell. It doesn't work like that. You need to open your heart right now. When you open your heart right now, when you open your heart, then you accept Jesus as the Passover lamb. 
You are now engrafted into his family. You are now adopted into his family when you open your heart. See, salvation is a gift. It's free. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. It is free. You just have to trust God and believe God. If you're not believing God, then who are you believing? There's, there's a manifestation of demonic activity that's building up. That's building up. I was told a story of a little girl whose mother had died. And I don't know how old the little girl was. She was young, like two or three years old. And somebody brought her to the, to the cemetery where her mother was buried. And when she got to the cemetery, she was waving her hand frantically. All right. And the person didn't know who she was waving it at. And they were getting ready to leave. And, and the lady she was with said, come on, baby, come on. She grabbed the baby by the hand and, and she's pulling her. The baby's trying not to leave and she's trying to pull her. And then the baby turned up her cheek to get a kiss from whatever she was. Let me tell you what the baby was interacting with. It wasn't her mother. It was a familiar spirit. What's familiar? What are familiar spirits? Familiar spirits are spirits that uh, re recognize or uh, that that resemble somebody you recognize. They masquerade. They they put on a front. They act nice. And they act whatever way that other person was acting. They may even act nicer than that. All right. And why are they doing that? Because, and you're going to see more and more manifestations of this sort. Why? Because deception is running rampant. And people today are inviting these demonic uh, uh, occurrences. They're inviting this garbage, all right, through, through, through television, through uh, tarot cards, through Ouija boards, through seances. Through, through, all right, you ready for this one? Through Halloween parties, all right? And even through uh, sex parties and, and through drugs, people are inviting, inviting. Now, excuse me, not once. Don't do it. Mm -mm. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't get deceived. Don't be deceived. People, God is not mocked. You're not going to make fun of God, all right? You, 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 I'm telling you now, listen, this is very important. Salvation is a gift. You can't earn it and you can't buy it. It's freely given. Don't be deceived. If an angel or anybody else come to you, talking about anything outside of the word of, listen, you better rebuke that thing. Say the blood of Jesus, bind it, tell it to get out of here because no one can replace Jesus. Let me, let me, yeah, dead, yeah, dead people aren't gonna, God not gonna send your mother or father or somebody to come talk to you. It's not gonna happen. It's not going to happen. Yes, we may encounter an angel, but it, everyone that dies is not an angel. No, no one, when the people die, they don't become angels. All right? Now, I want to make sure you understand that. When people die, they, oh, we got another angel in heaven. No, you don't. There's not another angel in heaven. When people die, they don't become angels. You stand and uh, you, you, you stand before the judgment seat of God. But when we depart from this body, all right, immediately we're in the presence of God, and then he decides left or right, heaven or hell. It, it happens so quickly. Now, now listen to me. There's no such thing as purgatory. There's no waiting, and then somebody's going to pray so many prayers to get you out. And 
you, you know, that's not going to happen. All right. It's, it's a deception. People, it's a deception. Salvation is a gift, but you must receive it while you are alive on earth. On earth. Listen, you just need to open your heart. You just need to open your heart. Now, you don't know what to pray. Here's a prayer that you could pray. If you don't know what to say, this is a guideline. All right? There is no sinner prayer in the Bible. This is a guideline. If you don't know what to say, if you want to pray on your own, pray on your own and just simply pray what's in your heart and ask Jesus to come into your heart. If not, pray this prayer with me. Father, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that he died for my sins and all my sins are forgiven because of his action of love. I believe that God raised him from the dead. I now declare that I am a child of God and I denounce the works of darkness. I believe that I am saved. Thank you for your gift of salvation. Friend, if you prayed that prayer or something similar to it, welcome to the family of Jesus. Just welcome. What a blessing it is to have you. And there goes the fireworks, right, in the background. I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray for you right now. Father, I pray for those who have opened their heart to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I bind demon spirits that's been assigned to steal this word out of their heart, to deceive them, to blind their eyes to the truth. I come against every work of the enemy. I declare every curse, vex, hex, spell, enchantment, bewitchment, and psychic power is broken from over their lives. Father, glorify your name in their lives. Reveal Jesus to them. Draw them to yourself through your love and kindness. Open the eyes of their understanding as they hear and read your word. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Well, blessings. Man, wow, what a powerful, what a powerful uh, Bible study. What a powerful Bible study. Now that you gave your life to Christ, hey, do some reading. You know, you, you've got to do some reading. You got to read the Bible. Read St. John chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 16. Read Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Then go back and read the entire book of St. John. Then go back and read the New Testament. Become a part of a, a church. Right now, it'd be good for you to read the Old and New Testament. But start with the New then go back, read the Old Testament. Then yeah, I'm, I'm telling you what I did. All right. Then I went back. I read the Old Testament. Then I read the New Testament. Then I, there was times when I read the, the Bible, at least the entire Bible, at least once a year. Right. You got to do that. You've got to do what it takes. You've got to do some research. You may even want to be uh, become part of a Bible school or something. All right. So that you could learn the word of God. You need to get this word deep down, deep rooted in your heart because Satan's going to come after you, all right? And he's going to try to get this word out of you to get you to stop believing the word of God. So praise God, friend, you want to do that, okay? I want to encourage you to sow a seed. Sow a seed. If you have a home church, sow a seed in there. First seed you could sow is you. That's right. Your gifts, your talents, your prayers can sow that seed. But don't forget the financial seed of your church. If you don't have a church, consider sowing a seed here. All right. Of your gifts, your talents, of yourself, your physical body. Be part of a, a local assembly. Let me tell you, God loves a cheerful giver. Okay. God loves a cheerful giver. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. 
Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Consider sowing a, a financial seed according to what's in your heart. All right, and that's where you can sow. It's right there on the screen. Take a screenshot of it. I want to thank you for all your gifts, your gifts and your support. Remember, your financial donations are given based upon your conscience, your generosity, and your faith. This is our order of worship right here. Sundays, our faith building worship service, currently on Facebook and Zoom. And on Wednesday, we have a roundtable Bible discussion on Facebook and YouTube. And then on Thursdays, our corporate intercessory prayer at 7 p.m. That is only on Zoom. That's it. Okay, why? Because we don't have public prayers like that. If you want to be part of our uh, part of the prayer, you need to get the 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 uh, Zoom address and get on board with us. All right. If you want to reach us, this is how you can reach us. Our our phone number is right there nine one two seven zero four seven zero four four, or you can email us. Uh, send us your 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 testimony if you. Uh, want to invite us for ministry engagement, this is how you would do it. You email us or you call us and we go from there, okay? We'll make everything a matter of prayer. Well, thank you for being with us today. We've gone a little bit over than what we normally do. Thank you for spending your time with us today. Our prayer is that you'll be blessed and grow in the grace of God. We're Jesus Christ Ministries International, the church without walls, evangelizing the world. And friend, believe me, we are in that season right now where the walls must come down and we must evangelize. We must reach out. We must. This is the harvest season. You hear me? This is the harvest season. And it's time for the body of Christ to fish like Jesus taught Peter to become fishers of men. God bless you. Have